Good afternoon to everyone who is joining with us. This is our um, student panel for the uh, Arkansas Association of Psych Black Psychology Professionals. So we are actually um, hosting this topic to focus on student resilience and coping during COVID-19. And so the focus of this session is going to be highlighting the common student stressors that have taken place during the transition to new forms of learning during the pandemic. I know there has been a huge, huge um, change in students' experiences. And I know one thing that our organization wants to do is help students during this time. So one way we think we could do that is to um, offer this panel for students to join and to listen in from some experts. And so we are definitely wanting to make sure that not only we talk about the common student concerns and stressors, but we also provide and discuss tools for adapting to the new learning environment and coping with our um, concerns in a uh, positive and healthy way. So we wanna make sure we protect mental health and well-being at the same time. So half of the discussion be, will be focused on addressing those types of issues. And we do have a few questions at the end that the panelists will be um, answering and or responding to. And then we will take, if you have a question, you are free to um, type that question into the chat box and I will be monitoring our chat box to make sure that those questions are addressed and we can um, see if the panelists have any other things that they would like to share um, after that. So that is the form of the, the, the session today. So I wanna start by introducing myself. My name is Dr. Darshan Reed. I am an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Central Arkansas. I've been there for now eight years and I'm also serving as the president elect right now of the Southwestern Psychological Association um, in which in April, I will be um, the president of that organization. So I absolutely am honored and just thrilled to be able to serve students even in that capacity. And then right now in this organization, I am serving as the chair of our student mentoring committee. So that is who I am and I'm your moderator for today. And then we have our uh, three panelists. The first panelist that we are going to introduce is Dr. Kyla Holmes. Um, she is the owner of Shalom Wellness Services, LLC, and she also provides therapy and psychological assessments for individuals ages 25 or 6 to 25. And she works with families to, uh, to establish stronger bonds and healthier ways of relating. Um, she has research interest in uh, cultural variables, trauma, averse childhood experiences, um, aggression, disruptive behaviors, and the intersection of mental health and faith. And she's also served in several leadership roles. She has been the president of this organization. Um, I believe she was the previous president of the um, Arkansas Association of Black Psychology Professionals. And she's also served, I believe, as the president of ARPA, uh, which is our local um, state organization. So um, we want to welcome Dr. Kyla. So Dr. Kyla, would you like to say anything at this moment? Well, hello, it's just a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Dr. Reed, for um, facilitating this wonderful event. So I'm just glad to be here and hope it can be of some assistance as our students are navigating this very difficult time. Awesome, thank you, thank you. And our next panelist is Mr. Kerry Crawford. He is the current president of the Arkansas Association of Black Psychology Professionals. He's also an adjunct professor of psychology at Philander Smith College. I believe he holds another leadership um, uh, title that I did not get to make it to the slide. So uh, Mr. Crawford, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about other positions or hats that you may wear during this time? Uh, hello, am I back, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Uh, I'm Kerry Crawford. I also uh, work for Arkansas Rehab Services. I've been there ongoing for like 31 years. I do uh, brief psychoeducational evaluations and mental health status evaluations on clients who are trying to get assistance for education or training uh, via rehab counselors throughout the state. Uh, other than that, I'm Okay, I'm just glad to be <laughs> part of this and, uh, and uh, looking forward to being as any help. Uh, like to give some input on the 
professor side of how hard it's been coping with uh, COVID-19 in the college environment too, if I get an opportunity. Okay, we will definitely take that um, information um, and just just here shortly. So thank you so much for joining us. And we are appreciative of you being able to be a part of our panel. Uh, so thank, our, you. thank you. So our last panelist is Dr. Alexis Davis. She has been trained as a clinical psychologist, uh, a Reiki master, divine healing, and is currently enrolled at the Root Psychology at the Institute of African Centered Thought to be certified as a root psychologist. Um, she has also served, I know personally, as a professor at the um, Philander Smith College. Um, and so she has been serving in multiple roles as a community um, activist. She's also served as a psychologist working with um, individuals. And then she's also um, working in, I know, a few other roles. So I will let her introduce herself at this time and bring us up to speed on what she's also doing during this time. I think you're still okay. muted. Okay, there you I go. I got it off of mute. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Alexis Davis. Um, as our, uh, Dr. Reed has mentioned, I uh, have previously been an assistant professor at Philander Smith College. Most recently, uh, this is a surprise to some people on this call, too. I was granted graduate faculty status at Jackson State University. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and I also have a podcast, Black Jewel, B-B-L-V-K-J-E-W-E-L, -E -E that highlights the Black Jewels in the community that stand in the gap for African people and people of African descent. Thank you all so much for being here. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking time to be a part of our panel. We really appreciate it. So with that, I want to go ahead and jump into the discussion because as the moderator, I'm going to give you a little bit of context and give you some information. Hopefully we can hear from a couple of the students on, um, on the session right now to um, provide some input because we want you to be engaged in this conversation as well. So um, some changes to the college experience that has, ha that has taken place due to COVID um, include um, transitioning to remote and virtual learning. I know as a faculty member, that was not as a big of a transition for me because I was al already teaching some um, remote learning courses However, it's a different situation when students are thrown into it, so they didn't sign up for those types of courses, and because most institutions were trying to be um, um, on the, the cautious side to protect people's health, they had to transition very quickly. Sometimes, I think our institution had to transition in less than a week to um, completely virtual and online learning. So I can imagine how much of the transition that was for students and how nerve wracking that could be, especially during midterms for that to take place. Because most of this transition happened in March where people were either just finishing midterms or getting right into it. So that's one of the big issues that have caused some anxiety and stress for students having multiple learning formats. So um, currently students who are in their fall courses, they may be balancing taking online classes with face-to-face -face classes with hybrid classes. So putting all that together can be a big, big stressor and a big area of concern because now you're trying to balance multiple formats of learning that you may be comfortable with these, you may not be comfortable, but all of them guaranteed have changed because of COVID. And then we also have communication with our instructors has changed. I know for me personally, I try to reach out to my students. However, some instructors are not able to reach out to their students due to connectivity issues. Um, a lot of instructors are trying to use um, Google Meet or Zoom for office hours and just really trying to stay connected to the students. But the communication with the instructors has drastically changed for a lot of students. So that could be more of a um, concern and stressor as well, just because they may have been used to just swinging by their professor's office or um, going up right after class is over to be able to have a conversation before or after class. And now that has changed for them. So now that may be something that's hindering them um, from their progress in their classes. And then we also have a lack of com uh, classroom community because with the transition to the different formats of learning, there has been a change in how students can actually communicate with each other. 
And I know one of the things that my, my students really valued was that time where they could just come in, sit in the classroom before class started and talk to their, their classmates and maybe lament about uh, an assignment. Oh God, we have to turn in this paper or, oh, this is coming up. Oh, do you remember we need to make sure we do this? Like just having that ability to talk with their classmates in that small time now has changed. So they may be lacking some of that support that they had and they maybe not have paid attention as much to it because it was just a part of their day to day. And now it's not. So just a lack of classroom community. Then you have student life and co-curricular activities have changed. Um, so I know I speak for just our campus, but we have very limited face-to-face -face gatherings on campus now, and they have to go through a very rigorous um, process to be approved. Um, so even if the RSOs and the student groups want to get together, they may be um, not able to because they don't have the space on campus to social distance or their, um, their request was denied because there was already too many um, other ones that have been approved. So there's not enough space to accommodate um, the other sessions. And so they're having to rely on Zoom a lot. And I don't know if you know the term, but there is a um, term now that people are using for people who are exhausted from being on Zoom. So we can have Zoom burnout or just Zoom, like Zoom exhaustion. I think that the term is something different. Um, I'm blanking on it right now, but a lot of people are experiencing uh, overload uh, for Zoom meetings or virtual meetings um, because it's just very taxing to be on those sessions on with people uh, at long links, especially when you go from class being that way to now having to do uh, social uh, sessions that way. So that could be a stressor or something that's not um, helping the, um, the, the support of the students. And then lastly, and this is not an exhaustive list, but last thing to be thinking about the transition from COVID um, to the, the how it's experiencing on the campus and the college experience is um, internships and supervised positions could have been canceled or limited. So now students are maybe frantic trying to figure out what am I going to do because this is a part of our program. I'm supposed to go from classwork to then internship or classwork to a supervised role or class ro uh, classwork to a research position and then I graduate. And so when that happens, now that's changed essentially your program um, requirements and or how you can finish. And I know a lot of our students may be really stressing out because they're not able to get those opportunities that they used to have readily available to them due to the COVID um, transition. So because of some of these things, and I'm, again, this is not an exhaustive list. So any of the panelists, um, I'll give you a moment if you can even add anything to this list that's not here, if you would like to say anything else that you can see or that you have seen that has been a change or transition for students. I, uh, I think for a lot of our students, uh, the abrupt, what I call it, eviction um, uh, from their dorm rooms and having uh -huh. to be placed back into environments that maybe they were working to um, evolve from. And mm -hmm. so then with that, um, being placed with some additional responsibilities. I know that spring semester, a lot of my students um, either weren't able to come to class because they had picked up two or three jobs because they yeah, had to take yeah. care of families. So I think also the responsibility that comes with this shift is, is taxing on, the stu on our students too. Absolutely. I just like to piggyback off to what Dr. Davis was saying. I totally agree that um, just that abrupt change with either not being able to go back to campus, having to leave their dorm, whatever the situation was. I think if it was already a strained situation, I'm thinking about family dynamics right now, that there, if it was already strained family dynamics, arguments, um, challenges in communication and just figuring out because they're already at that, at that age, right? 18, 19, 20, they're already at that age where they're even transitioning more fully into trying to have some measure of independence and their parents, depending on, or their caregivers are kind of maybe struggling with 
releasing that, allowing them to enter into that next phase of life and have that measure of independence while also knowing that they're still somewhat dependent on their parents. Like that's a, t that's a difficult time in life anyway for sometimes for families to navigate. So sometimes having that distance and being at college really helped, but now know they're back at home and back in those challenges and still trying to get their schoolwork done, right? Mm -hmm. Still trying to stay focused on top of having a job and still having to navigate family dynamics that could have already been strained and already been difficult. Um, so that's kind of part of, of what I'm seeing as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Um, and I see that on our campus as well. So a lot of our students and it'll come up, I guess, and actually um, on some of the, the slides that we're going to talk about in just a minute, it'll come up. The same things that you all are saying um, are definitely plaguing um, our students' um, mental health and their experiences. Mr. Crawford, did you want to add anything? Mm -hmm. I'm unmuted now. You are. Okay. Another thing I just throw in, I know you have some additional slides, some students I've had a chance to talk to was attending class from out of state. Uh, responsibility of tutoring their younger brothers and sisters. A lot of these students now have gone home, not only are they a student, but now they have a responsibility of teaching their younger brothers and sisters who are at home doing virtual classes and that uh, responsibility has been laid on them. So they trying to navigate not only their classwork and coursework, but help the brothers and sisters na navigate their classwork also. And that's been an additional strain to them. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you for sharing that too. Um, just this idea of responsibilities changing um, have definitely impacted um, our students. And so um, just kind of moving to the next thing I would like, if there's any students um, who are sh sharing with us, I don't know if the people on live, I don't have access to see what your comments may be, but anyone who would like to chime in um, or anybody else who's currently on the call who is not a student, but maybe you've talked to students, um, what is one of the most difficult things that um, has impacted their learning for um, this pandemic? Like what is one specific thing that they feel has been the most difficult part of learning um, during this pandemic? So I just wanna provide an opportunity for other people to chime in on this part of the discussion. And you can type that in the chat and or if the people who are sharing on live, if um, maybe Dr. Holmes or someone else who has access to those, they can share those too. Right. So I am on I'm on Facebook Live. So if anybody yes has any comments on Facebook Live, I'm looking at that and Dr. Davis might be as well. OK. OK. So just give the people a few minutes if you would like to, to chime in or share about one thing. Um, and while people may be typing, I'll say um, a lot of students have told me personally that the hardest part about learning on or during this pandemic is really being able to focus. Um, because they either are in a, an environment that is not conducive to them being able to study. And so they have a harder time trying to focus, even if they're listening to their professor on a recording, or if they're um, watching a re recording that they was not live, um, they just have a hard time focusing during this time because so many things are happening. I think um, we have a comment um, that says family members diagnosed with COVID and death of family members. And then students who may also have been diagnosed limited access to healthcare. Absolutely. All right. Uh, and I know also um, a lot of students have discussed like, the online version now takes away from the connectedness. So them feeling even like, am I even a student? I've heard a lot of students and even my own niece has stated like, I'm not in school. I'm literally just submitting assignments. And mm -hmm. like, I'm just trying to make sure that my assignments get graded. And so like, even the whole notion of what it means to be a student is transforming through this COVID experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as students that they're, they're 
basically disconnecting. This is not what they signed up for. This is not what they thought, especially the students who are incoming freshmen. They were excited to be able to say, I'm going to college. I'm getting ready to enroll. And that whole, um, we have um, the social norms and the expectations that are surrounding that experience, that transition process. Um, it's just now it's dissolved and it's just gone. And so how to deal with that or how to handle that. And especially with the illness, I've had multiple students who have actually um, been diagnosed with COVID during their time during the semester and they have to quarantine, of course, um, but that impacts their ability to actually work because if they have a severe enough case, they're not actually able to do their work. And then they're having to catch up. So they have multiple classes that they're trying to catch up on two weeks later after they feel better or after they've overcome it, um, that that is just something that's so hard to deal with and so hard to do with everything else that's going on around them. Um, so, so many things for us to think about as how the students are experiencing this. So I wanted to give some, um, some data. Um, there's a survey that the Digital Promise conducted um, this is one of the uh, platforms that the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, provides support to. And they conducted the survey and asked students about their satisfaction before and after COVID-19. And these are the percentages. 51% they were said they were very satisfied with the courses before COVID. And then I want you to look at 87% said they were somewhat satisfied with their courses before COVID. And then um, 19, some uh, said satis very satisfied with their courses after COVID, but then only 59% said someone somewhat satisfied with their courses after COVID. So we know that something was happening where those very satisfied people were no longer satisfied. And it's, the, the other results suggested they didn't blame instructors for the transition or why they weren't satisfied. It was some of the things that we're talking about that we've already mentioned. That's why they're not satisfied with the experience. And then when we look a little bit further, we have some key findings from the student survey that was conducted by the Global Strategy Group um, here in August. And their results suggested that first, a substantial number of students are were considered essential employees. So they were still working and they had to go to work. And even during the pandemic, 26% 26, 26 of the college students were employed either full-time or part-time. Among that group, 52% of the college students were working in these jobs that were deemed essential, so they could not stop working. And then the last finding um, that they highlighted was that the um, suggestion that college students were forced to divide their attention and even spend time in jobs that potentially were jeopardizing their health while also trying to get their education online. So that was definitely something that, again, they didn't sign up for that, but that's what they're in and having to deal with right now. So, and, and Dr. Dr. Reed, if I could just interject, just, just that piece right there, like yeah. to me, that just shows those were stats that I didn't know. I wasn't familiar with that. So to mm -hmm. me, that's so helpful to know that they have that a lot of our college students have that on their plate. Um, and, and one somebody comment, I just wanted to, to, to note a comment on Facebook, which I think kind of fits with what you're talking about here. Um, and is a word that I've heard from, from people that I work with is independence. And I think people in college at that phase of life really value really feeling and experiencing a moment of independence in a way that they haven't before. And that and that's very appropriate, that's very healthy, that's very timely for that period in life to feel that sense and navigate being independent. Um, but somebody just commented, they said finding peace back home, they had to discover what provided them with peace, I guess, in their hometown, but when they were in their college experience, um, saying that they had their peace because they were independent and managed a lot of things better. So that was a big shift to kind of go back to like, uh, that they were finally in their groove of peace, finally in their groove of independence, finally in their groove, and now shifting back and trying to navigate that could be really difficult. So if he, especially in the midst of if they are one of these essential employees, mm -hmm. just, I, you know, I can't imagine it's really tough. Very, very tough. And then um, 
another finding was that the move to online education has meant that basic education needs were not being um, fulfilled by for students. So having to uh, access labs, specialized equipment, clinicals, internships, as well as staying motivated were the biggest challenges from this survey that students. So 53% said that having access to all of the things they needed just for their classes was uh, a challenge. And then 50% said motivation was a challenge. They're not, they, they are no longer motivated like they were to, to be able to do it. And I think that comes across in um, Dr. Davis's comment about the students who are saying, I just need to submit my assignments. I just need to, to, to do this work. I'm not really here for trying to do anything extra. I'm just trying to submit the assignment. And that tells you that their motivation level has gone way down because students typically want to experience that community and be a part of the college experience, be a part of the campus and the RSOs or whatever organizations they want to, to uh, promote. But now it's gone way down to just, I just want to submit my assignments and be done. That's all. So we really have to be concerned about that aspect of the student and how even just the motivation for something they worked so long to, to, to strive for, their education, now it's kind of dwindling in terms of do I still want to continue to do this? And some, some of the research that I've actually come across suggests that students are questioning whether they should even continue their, um, their degree or their education because they're thinking, is this going to be worth it? Especially during this time, is it worth it for me to go back? Maybe I should wait and wait till we get back to normal before I actually go back and start working on this degree. So a lot of students are thinking about that right now during this time. Yeah, and to piggyback on that last comment that you mentioned, um, what I was gonna say, cause I wanna make sure that we're focusing on the, the dichotomy here, mm -hmm. um, because I've also noticed a lot of students, especially that college age realm and even under becoming entrepreneurs. Like my 14 year old niece is working on a lip gloss line. Um, Kaya, who actually made a comment, shout out, she has her own business. So I'm seeing a lot of students um, start their own business. So that's another beauty of this as well is that students are seeing like, hey, there's some other avenues that I can operate in while being in this space and place of college. Absolutely. So I definitely want to give that shout out and make sure we acknowledge that. Um, and one of the things that I think I, will, I was going to say towards the end is that this transition or this COVID um, crisis has definitely allowed us to see what other areas of opportunity and growth we have. So it's not just, oh, here's something we're losing, but what can I gain or what can we get from this experience that could be more of a growth or a helpful thing to us during this process? So the other, um, the other findings that I think this is the key, and this is what I kind of just immediately saw as consistent with what we've been talking about. From the results of the survey that was conducted by Digital Promise, 79% said that staying motivated was a problem for them. So almost 80% of the students, and they surveyed, I believe, over, um, I want to say it's over 2,000 students in this survey from a, a very good, uh, diverse group. And over 80% said staying motivated was an issue. 55 said trying to find a quiet place to do their work was a problem. Just finding a quiet place. I can testify that I've had students during class, they were in their car because that was the only place that they could actually get some isolation, some quiet, and or that may have been the only place that they could really get their work kind of just out and okay, I can focus in this in my car. 54% um, said balancing home and family responsibilities was a concern. And I think, again, that's consistent with what Dr. Holmes and Dr. Uh, Davis were talking about. Just that shift in, in transition of responsibilities has been very difficult. 45% said knowing where to get help with the course. Like, they don't even know. And, and this is a big deal because a lot of students, when they transition to online, online platforms, are a, a difficulty in understanding by themselves because different faculty may post things in these folders. They may have an information or frequently asked question page. These people don't. And you're just 
kind of fending for yourself if you don't have someone who's there to walk you through where you need to look for. And that could be um, in some ways um, like deflating. I want to do this, but I don't even know where I'm supposed to go to get this information. So how am I going to finish this stuff? Or So that's something the student said that that's a concern. And then feeling too unwell because they're physically or emotionally drained. So just like Dr. I think Dr. Griffin was mentioning the students who were saying that they couldn't do it because they weren't feeling well because they may have been diagnosed and or family members not feeling well. And then the whole emotional side, we know um, we are uh, social creatures. We have a need for affiliation. I teach this in my social psych and my multicultural psych classes. We are supposed to be with other people. But right now we can't be with other people like we want to be with other people. So that's an emotional toll on us. How do we reconcile? We want to be safe. We want to be uh, healthy. But we want to have that, that affiliation and that connection to our friends, to our peers, to our professors, to, to the people that we, again, we thought this is going to be the experience. So almost 50% of students said that that was an issue. And then 31% said fitting in the coursework with their work. Again, that responsibility of balancing essential workers, their, their job duties with actually doing um, what they need to do for their courses. And again, I can testify that I've had a student who actually was at work. She's walking around doing work while she's in class and she's listening. And I said, I'm giving her A for effort because she's here. She's trying to be here, but she has to be at work because she's an essential worker. And again, you, you just have to, to do what you can do. So those are some of the things that we know from the research that has already been conducted in the last two to three months. That's what students are responding and saying. So. Here's my questions for our panelists. So I'm going to stop most of my talking and allow them to give us their um, insight and their expertise. So the first question I have for the panelists is, what tools or strategies do you recommend to students struggling to adapt to the new learning environment? So what could be some tools or strategies that you see beneficial for them if they're struggling to adapt to just the new learning environment in general? My initial um, thought, if, oh, <laughs> we all got a thought about that. The okay, fun thing I, about tech, I, I, technology and Zoom and panels. Am I on or am I off or am I off or am I on? Am I on or off? You're on. I'm on. Okay. One of the things I would suggest that I've had to do for myself is you, learning how to re, reorganize your time. You have to do some real good time management. Uh, you have to try your, as best as you can to not only set aside some time to study, but also set a time some, for you to get do your own space, to relax, to meditate, or to have some sort of other activity gonna help decrease the level of stress that you're feeling throughout the day. Uh, so I recommend to students that you, 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 you find that time and you reward yourself uh, with doing something that you relax, enjoy as, as, as a reward for being able to do part of your assignment or part of your school or your schoolwork. And, um, and also um, give yourself a break. Uh, I, I found out a lot of the students that I work with would have had accommodations in the classroom had we been in regular classrooms. And you have to understand that uh, accommodations like extended time, you know, lesson assignments and all those kind of things we would normally do for them in a classroom setting, they're going to have to allow themselves to have that same time and not feel so pressured uh, with that as they might in a virtual setting. Uh, so that would be a couple of strategies that I would recommend. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would definitely agree um, with everything Mr. Crawford said and also just emphasizing meditation. Um, and I know for some students, because uh, when I introduced that to some of my students, they were like, well, when are we going to meditate if we got all this noise? So then I, you know, was like, okay, well, 7 a.m. every Wednesday, we're going to get together and we're going to wake up early. And we're going to meditate. And so for them, they found like waking up earlier before maybe their household gets up is the quietest time for them. So finding the quietest times for the household that you're in and using that time to optimize the things that you need to get done. Um, also, just because y'all know I love hip hop, pay 
attention to the songs that you're listening to and that you have on repeat and see if that's reflective of any mood changes that you're experiencing. Um, be mindful if that's encouraging you or discouraging you to be motivated and then shift your music options to reflect something that's a little bit more encouraging. Um, and, and if you need to feel those feelings, maybe allow yourself some time to feel that, but also make a plan on how you can shift your music and reach out to your resources. I know a lot of the colleges still have their counseling centers up in Rundin and they're adjusting to deal with the online. Um, so definitely make sure that you're utilizing your resources, being mindful of the music that you're listening to, and then finding those quiet spaces and times in your households to optimize the things that you need to get done. Thank you. Yeah. I think that that's great. I mean, what you all have said, because I feel like that's the foundation of it. Like people really carving out time to take care of themselves, carving out time to clear their thinking because there's so much going on. So, I mean, I just definitely want to agree with that. Whatever way that students can extend themselves, some grace, some compassion, like be kind to yourself. Please be kind to yourself during this time. But the other things that, that I really feel like that I was kind of thinking about as you were talking, Dr. Reed, and presenting your information is this idea of what, what, is, um, what are our perspectives? What is our perspective, our focus, and then skill building? So when I say perspective and focus, it's easy to kind of focus on the things that's not within our control. It's easy to focus on the things that are the barriers and the challenges. Right. So, for example, with these online platforms, this is just a kind of maybe a simple example. I've heard that um, kind of like what Mr. Crawford was saying, most of the individuals that I would talk to in college, they're individuals who had mental health challenges pre-COVID. Right. So that's kind of my perspective that they already had challenges. And now, and like Mr. Crawford said, they would have already had accommodations, maybe. And now the online platform is presenting challenges with that, because what I'm hearing, some of them will won't give that time, like when you answer it, the question is answered, like you can't go back or something like that with some of them. And they're used to being able to go back and think and maybe the test didn't allow for that. And now they're stressed and struggling and, and that kind of thing because the format is just literally different. So we try to talk about like what is in their control, what can you do? So I encourage focus on what is in your control. If it's something you can talk to your professor about, talk to them about it. If it's something, just please just build your skills in that way. So that's why I say focus, what are we focusing on? What is our perspective? And then see it as an opportunity to build your skills in an area that college is really for. College is really about that time of how to talk to people right? How to get your needs met, how to advocate for yourself, how to assert yourself, how to manage your time. Because I under, I know that going from the, their challenge in ways in college that they weren't challenged in high school, they never had to do certain things. And now, unlike in, in middle school, from some of these kids who have virtual learning, um, somebody commented on Facebook, I just want to bring attention to it, saying even in middle schools, he is struggling with not knowing what to do. They don't even know who their teachers are, don't have teacher communication, right? Now, in middle school, Hopefully parents or caregivers are there to help be an advocate for them and show them that college students, they're going straight from parents, maybe doing that when they were in middle school and high school to maybe not necessarily doing that in, in college. So now they not only learning how to do college, but it's so many demands and so because they're having to navigate it independently. So I also encourage students to if you're if you know that you have a hard time asserting and communicating yourself to adults and you're still learning how to do that with people in authority, get some mentorship, reach out to somebody who can help you in knowing how to frame um, emails to your professors, how to frame conversations with them, and just how to do it in a way that won't feel so anxiety provoking and uncomfortable. So I'll pause there. I can go on and on about that, but I encourage you to watch your perspective, watch your focus, and see it as an opportunity to build very necessary life skills that you would need to be successful in life anyway. And I want to add this from the um, instructor side. We want to help you. We need to hear from you. I reach out to my, my students, but realistically, I have over um, 150 students right now that I'm having to try to reach out and monitor. So I do do classroom communications literally almost every other day to my students to remind them. But if something is going on, 
I want to hear from the student and I want to be able to help them, but I need to know because I can only email so much, but you can talk to your instructors. We're here to be able to navigate this transition with you. We're going through it just like you are. I tell my students, I'm giving you grace. Please give me a little extra dose of grace. So how, however much I'm giving you, give me a double dose back because I'm, I'm trying to help everybody. But I want to help you. And that's the thing I think most students don't want to understand is that we are here to help you. We're here. I call myself a coach. I'm helping you and coaching you through to your next plan and your next goal. But a coach can only go so far if the player or if the athlete is not willing to um, do what they need to do or communicate to the coach. Hey, coach, I need this. Hey, coach, what happens about this? So go to those instructors and talk to them. I promise they're not going to just say no, no. Some of them, if they are, they probably are not the, the person that needs to be in the instructor seat. But the, the instructors that I know, I think all of them would, would say, we want to help our students. We want to see you to be successful during this time. Even before this time, we want to see you successful, but absolutely during this time, we want you to be thriving. So talk to those instructors and your professors or even the teachers. I'll encourage those who talked about middle school Parents, be involved. Talk to the teachers. If you need to set up a Zoom meeting with the teacher or if you need to call the school, pick up the phone and call. I think those instructors at those levels are willing to help your students as well. They may be overwhelmed, but if you reach out to them personally, I promise I think they're going to try to help you in whatever way that they can because we all are on the same side of wanting your students to be successful. Definitely. And also, um, Good segue and a little shameless plug. If you check out our page, um, Kim Lawrence actually did a video on advocacy tips for parents. And that could also be applied to college students as well. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention is to get connected with the associations that align with your career move. So if there are students in Little Rock, get connected with the Arkansas Association of Black Psychology Professionals. That creates a... Um, a connection to more mentors. And in this time, that's needed. Mentorship is needed for everybody. So definitely get connected to those organizations that align with your career goals and aspirations. Thank you, thank you. I think I muted myself. Okay, so we're gonna jump to the next question and we may have touched on a couple of questions, but we'll just go through them. The second question is, what do you recommend for students who are experiencing a lack of motivation during this time? Because that was 80% of our students. How would you help them and or suggest something to help their motivation levels? Wake, okay. <laughs> the, first, <laughs> the first thing, I'm gonna be very transparent. The first thing that came to my mind was waking up every morning listening to Kendrick Lamar's, all right, we gonna be all right. Do you hear me? Do you feel me? We gonna be all right. Cause like we have to affirm ourselves, like life is just difficult, right? Like period. And then when you add COVID and all the other world things that are happening, it could get just to bog us down. And so finding songs, I'm always go back to that, finding songs that will motivate you. Um, also reaching out, um, reaching out to those people who you have deemed as support your support system. And if you have a low support system, maybe again, getting connected to those organizations to build up your support system. Um, I just read this quote, like, I had to learn in order for me to stop hurting, I had to tell the truth about the fact that I was hurting. And so, you know, nobody can read your mind. We all want to be there for each other because we understand this is a hard time for all of us. And so reaching out, listening to good songs, Kendrick Lamar, I, that's a great song. I love myself. That's a great song. So definitely tune in to the vibrations that will keep you lifted. Thank you, Dr. Holmes or Mr. Crawford. Yeah, I love that idea that Dr. Davis was saying, because I mean, people have been hearing us repeatedly say the word connections. So I'm not going to read it, but just please know that that's going to be a theme. Connect, 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 be it with organizations, virtually connect with your friends, connect with something. Feel you, We need to feel connected because as I, as I heard you say that question and saw that question, Dr. Reed, my, one of my initial thoughts were what is people have to have that awareness as to what is zapping your motivation? 
like what is it so people have to know do i feel decreased motivation because i feel i don't feel as connected i don't feel as supported so then, then they know that's my thing then. So I need to find a way to get connected and get yeah. that mentor, connect with peers. That's maybe why some people, because there's so much going on, they're not sleeping well. You don't mm-hmm. sleep well, that's going to impact your energy and motivation. Get some yeah. good sleep hygiene going. So people have to know what it is. If, if certain relationships and certain things you're looking at mm-hmm. on social media, if that's draining yeah. your energy, your motivation, all of that goes together, energy, motivation, and focus. If that's draining you, put up more boundaries. I've heard several college students actually during this time, I've met with them. They told me they have either decreased or completely gotten off of social media. I mean, I know it's a big deal to say for our college students now, because the people who are like 18, 19, 20 now, they came into the world almost with social media. Like they don't, that's hard. You know, they've been doing that since middle school, right? So that's a big shift for them. But even them, they have told me I deactivated my Instagram. I got off of social media and I feel so much better. I feel so much more encouraged. I have more energy. So because that was draining them. So anyway, you have to have that self-awareness as to what is draining your motivation. So then you know how to proceed. And I'll just piggyback on that, too. Even not just social media. I think even during this whole election cycle, people were just tuning into news stations all the time. I found myself doing that. I had to turn the TV off and not turn it on. Like I would watch the local news for 30 minutes and say, hey, I can't watch any more news because this is overwhelming. I felt myself getting uneasy and just having that anxiety. So maybe it's not just social media, but turn the TV or any other media that you're consuming, turn it down a notch or turn it off if you need to, to make sure that you're able to increase your motivation because it may even be just draining your time. It may not be causing you any kind of emotional stress, but if you're spending too much time, it could be demotivating you because you realize, oh, I've just spent that whole hour and I should have been doing it on this work or I could have been doing something else that I enjoy. So just making sure you're recognizing how to, like she said, identify where the demotivation is happening and where it's coming from so that it could be addressed or adjusted. And Mr. Crawford, did you have anything to say? I think you're. You got to unmute yourself, Mr. Crawford. Okay. I'm going to throw in jazz as well as hip hop. I I think that for some students, hip hop may not do it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think listening to jazz and or gospel music is also a good way to relax and get your mind at ease. Uh, Another thing I was thinking about is exercising. I'm finding out now that. I, I call like feel like I'm in a bear cave, and uh, sometimes uh, isometric exercise is just doing some you know, some basic things and stretching and stuff like that to kind of because if you if when you, you know, get your body from not being so tight and tense and stuff like that, and then definitely um, how you measure success. I've I've had to and I've encouraged students to uh, you can't measure success the way you did when you're in, in other environments now. You're gonna to have to look at how you measure your success and then award yourself and feel more accomplished by getting things done, any any amount of things done versus looking looking at what you have done versus what you need to do, what you haven't done. A lot of times uh, you can feel overwhelmed if you don't allow yourself to look at the bit of things you have accomplished versus what you still feel like you need to get done for the semester or for that course. So true. So true. Thank you so much for that. Um, The third question is, what would you tell a student who is having difficulty balancing home and family responsibilities? Because that was a huge issue. Um, I know we can't tell them what to do in their household, but is there any tips or advice that you all could give to them if they're struggling trying to balance that home and family responsibility role? That's a tough one. You're on I think, mute. Yeah, you're, you're mute. You're, you're yeah. on mute. You're still I'm on mute. Mute. There I'm, you go. I'm out now? You're good, yeah. Okay. Uh, be honest about it. I can remember um, early in my life, we used to have family meetings, and sometimes it's tough. But sometimes I think what you what you need to do is just be honest, say, uh, be honest with your family members, say, listen, I'm having a hard time dealing with this. Uh, might not change anything, but sometimes just letting them know what, what concerns you have uh, and, and understanding that um, 
it may not change in the near future. I, I think that's kind of a hard thing to deal with. I, I've had some students I've talked to who uh, I hear the noise in the background and you, you, you hear the yak yak in the background and you know it's a difficult situation. But I think it was said earlier, you have to find that time early in the morning and late in the afternoon where you can have some me time, some in the closet time, some time where you can balance that because giving that balance is gonna help you deal with that. But I'll say, uh, I'm not saying being confrontative with your mother, your father, your grandmother, nothing like that. I'm not saying to get into an argument, but I think you're gonna to have to be honest within yourself, okay? What part of this can I change? What part of this I'm gonna to have to make an adjustment to? What part of it I'm gonna to have to deal with until this COVID situation um, will be over, which may be a year from now. So who knows? Yeah, I would agree with that, Mr. Crawford. That is a tough balance. And again, my, my framework is, is just this idea of working with college students who, again, uh, many of them already had some challenges but pre-COVID, um, so I know it might not have, this balancing issue may not be as intense or emotionally distressing for everybody. So some of it, it may be learning how to manage your time, getting a, well, I say a planner because I'm still in the paper planner, <laughs> but in your phone or wherever you plan, wherever you organize and wherever and however you manage time. For some people, it may be a matter of just really implementing those skills putting boundaries in place and really carving out how you spend your time and make be more of a time management prioritization type of issue. Some people who really they have challenges now, it's relational things like with their parents, grandparents and caregivers. Honestly, if it gets real intense, this is where I may have to do a plug for uh, feeling free to reach out and get some professional assistance with that to a professional uh, mental health provider to just talk that out with them. You don't have to go to them and say, oh, I'm having a lot of issues and I'm, you know, people might say crazy or so. You know, it's not about that. It's just saying you need somebody beyond a friend. You may talk to friends about it and mentors and get support. And that's great. But sometimes it is at a level where it might be good to bounce that off and, and process this with a, a, with a therapist or a counselor who can give you very helpful tools for how to communicate effectively and solve problems. And I always tell the, the, the individuals that I work with, I am not saying to disrespect your parents or your caregivers, please hear me. I'm not saying that, but I am saying there could be some healthy ways to communicate so you all can get on the same page about what's needed. Absolutely. And I just want to make sure um, you kind of went into one of the other questions is okay. protecting mental health and well-being. And then I think the last question I had is where or who they should go to seek help for emotional distress and anxiety. So for the sake of time, if you all would like maybe give maybe one more kind of comment about kind of wrapping those two together, protecting mental health and well-being, but where to go to seek help if they need it for emotional distress. There was a huge percentage of students in a lot of the research findings um, that I checked out that I think it was upwards to about maybe 70% of students were experiencing some level of anxiety and up to probably a 50% of students were experiencing moderate to severe anxiety during this time. So maybe speaking to them just very quickly about how to handle that, where to go to get that help if they need it. Um, definitely wanna piggyback and emphasize what Dr. Holmes mentioned about reaching out to professional mental health counselors. Also be okay with your individual journey. If you're in some more holistic health, Reiki, get, do what you think is best for you. Um, the Safe Place app, is a great app to download that's geared towards black mental wellness. It has assessments on there for anxiety, depression, PTSD, and some other things. So you could do an assessment and see what comes out. It also has a directory to mental health providers within it and tons of other great tips and tools. Um, also make sure uh, therapyforblackgirls.com. I just want to use this time to give some resources because we could tell you to do all of these things things, but um, without the resources, it may be difficult to get to these uh, actual things. Um, so therapyforblackgirls.com, they have a state-by-state -state directory, and then Black Zen, B-L-A-C-K-Z-E-N, they actually, um, it's a meditation company that's 
created by two sisters who are all for emphasizing meditation among black and brown communities. So definitely tap into those resources, um, telehealth and insurance coverage I see coming coming out. There are providers who are providing services via um, different safe uh, internet services and I'll let Dr. Holmes expand on that some more. Okay, I'm sorry, I was muted. So absolutely, um, I, I, I tried to put some of those, Dr. Davis, in on the Facebook page, but if there's anything I missed, if you could please add that there. Um, so absolutely, I think when it gets to the point where people feel like because of emotional distress and anxiety, so if I could say just a little bit about the signs of when they need to go. So if stress and anxiety is interfering with your ability to sleep, you have decreased appetite, you're crying a lot, you feel overwhelmed and it's affecting your ability to focus and make decisions that you know that you just feel off. Some people might say, I just feel off or they have panic symptoms and don't know where that's coming from. Maybe they feel their heart rate beating fast. They, um, they're having a hard time. Sometimes breathing, their chest is hurting. Anything like that where you're seeing, feeling like you have a hard time managing what your symptoms are, please um, reach out. You can go through your uh, primary care physician um, a lot of college students may be still on their parents' insurance. If you feel that, that you have the, the kind of connection with your parents where you can reach out to them and help and ask them to facilitate that for you, they can potentially do that through their insurance and then get a list of providers. Um, the Arkansas Association of Black Psychology Professionals, our organization, we are developing a directory of Black therapists in the state of Arkansas. You can feel free to message us or inbo inbox us on Facebook, and we can try to give you some names and some referral ideas um, for that. So there are options on your campuses. Now, some campuses, if they have you know, some students are still going in person. I know it's different by campus, but I had a young lady who shared with me that she was having a very difficult moment one day and she went to one of the counselors there on campus and she just did a kind of walk in and that counselor was very helpful listening to her and say, come back anytime. So many of these college campuses have, um, have counseling centers and they have that available to you either on campus, they may be doing some in-person stuff or if not, many providers are doing virtual. So that's what we mean by telehealth is it's virtual on the computer in a private confidential format where they can meet with you and many insurances are covering that right now. Um, so yes, I would encourage you to look into that and please do that. Thank you, thank you. And so just as a wrap up, I appreciate everything from the panelists. Um, we wanna make sure I wrap up. Here, So I did have a couple of closing thoughts. So first thing is to recognize that COVID-19 may have taken a toll on your learning experience, but that does not mean you can't thrive during this unusual time. And I think that's, again, focusing on what you can change, what you can control, but also focusing on how this may show you, you can grow or areas for you to to start something new or build those skills that we've been talking about that you need during the college experience, be able to, to grow in those skills. The second closing thought I would say is make the best of this learning experience and give yourself grace. We've already talked about that over and over. You're not going to see the same maybe uh, success that you've seen in previous semesters. So just recognize success looks different in COVID-19, but success is success and growth is growth. Progress is progress. If it's one thing that you've done that you got off your to-do list, that's progress. So count that and be positive about it. Don't consider it as, oh, I still have so much to do. Just be thankful that you were able to do that one thing. Reach out and talk to your instructors. They are wanting their best resources for help. And I'll extend that to say, reach out and talk to other mental health professionals or parents or supportive family members, if you feel yourself not being able to overcome the anxiety or the stress, reach out to someone and get help and seek the help when you need it. Don't suffer in silence. So that's the last thing that I would say. And I did like this quote um, that it says, in adverse circumstances, every creature becomes something else evolving or devolving. So we can always evolve, we don't have to devolve, and we can always make sure that we are thriving and not just surviving. 
So I appreciate everything from the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Thank you, Dr. Davis. We appreciate this time and we hope it's been giving you something to um, take with you and help you during this journey. Please feel free to reach out to any of us um, if you would like further information or if you would like to connect with our association, um, you can reach out to us on Facebook. Um, we do have um, other connections via email and all of that can be just basically direct you to our Facebook page and um, and or I think we have a YouTube presence as well and you can see us through the YouTube channel as well. So thank you so much. We enjoyed having this session and I just hope everybody is taking care of yourself and each other. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.